I'm really glad to be here. Uh, maybe some of you have seen this uh, tweet that Scott Gell sent out back in May about making sure that you test your, your site for speed. And as someone who has just a modest WordPress site, I just thought that'd be like a no-brainer. Right? I have a real simple site. I'm a really good guy in the sense that I make sure I have a responsive theme. I even was kind of clever and I made a child theme so I could like strip away all the crazy stuff. I am a UX designer, so I like to jettison lots of things from my site. And I made it really clean and thought that this would be no problem at all. So I ran this test and sure enough, I was at 5137. And I'm like, it's a WordPress site. How could I possibly be so bad? So I went ahead and rolled up my sleeves, you know, put up you know, Chrome dev tools and found out that WordPress is kind of stupid. Sorry. But it does quite a few things with 301 redirects on, on small images. So I'm like, OK, fine. I, I can fix this. So I went ahead and I changed a couple of things, changed the way I did thumbnails. I actually ended up moving site hosts. I found out that a big chunk was that. And sure enough, what I was able to do is I got onto 2354. I was pretty excited by the fact that a lowly UX designer could roll up his sleeves and make such a difference. And by the way, just to make sure that Steve is happy, I have a Y slow score of A. Steve, it's an A, okay? So the point, though, was that, now I'm not trying to butter you guys up like, hey, I care about speed. I kind of do, but I mean, my point was to say that I, this is a good experience for me to kind of figure this out, but it raises a broader question. What does speed actually mean? Because I'm a UX designer, and not many people remember, but back in the 90s, we were called UI designers. And the difference from the I to the X was that back in the 90s, we were about the interface, the actual screen, the website. But we wanted to have the broader end-to-end -end experience, so we became UX designers. And I think speed has that same issue, because of course, it's absolutely critical that we do everything we can to make our pages render quickly. That's obviously table stakes for the web. But the real question is, how did I get to that page? What was the experience of me wanting to get to that page and getting there? Well, OK, Scott, you probably were just basically clicking on a link from a search page. OK, fine. Well, how'd you do that page? Well, you were probably on a, a Google page. And pretty soon it starts looking like, well, it's just turtles all the way down. You know, It's like you're just on one web page after another. And that's fine. But it's like, are we always going to live within this little virtual world of exclusively the web? And in that world, yes, speed is probably the only critical issue, but there has to be, we have to move from I to X. I mean, how are people thinking about and getting to these sites? So yes, there's a certain way of kind of seeing these pages all strung together, but where are they doing it? And the first answer is always, oh, well, you're on desktop, or you're on mobile, and you're doing things like that. Well, that's fine, but that's what you're using. Uh, my question was, where are you using it? And it's like, you could be in your office, but you could also be like in a store. And it raises this question that we've all probably seen before, which is to say, how do you go from a physical location to then get to some information, something that's available on a website? Now, this has been tried before for an awful long time, and people have realized the value of bringing the web into the physical world. This is not an, a new idea at all, but the only attempt we've really seen so far has been these lovely things. And we all know how well they worked. Now, to be fair, they've worked well in Japan and China for very complicated social reasons. But for the most of the world, they really haven't worked, and they have very limited use. Have any, has anybody seen this Tumblr, pictures of people scanning QR codes? <laughs> yeah, this part? I love this part. That part's really great. Um, it's, it's a, it shows that the willingness is there, but we haven't quite found the right way to do it yet. But let's just leave our little bubble of the web for a second and look at a completely different part of technology, which is we're seeing a lot of smart devices. There's smart TVs, there's smart vending machines, there's smart bus stops, and people are playing around with physical interaction, but they're not using the web. What? What's going on? Why, what, what? They all have their own native app for the simple reason that the web just can't do it. I'm not saying this is a duck. A dumb idea, it's like, well, it's, that's the only choice they have. It's the only tool in the toolkit. And that's fine right now, but if we believe in Moore's Law at all, and we really believe that these smart devices are going to keep coming, we'll have kind of like three right now, then we'll kind of have maybe like seven next year, and then maybe we'll have 30 the following year. It's like, wait a second, am I really going to be installing an app for every one of these things? This just doesn't scale. This doesn't make any sense. Now, I'm not anti-app, I'm just anti-thousands of apps. I don't want to manage that on my phone. The superpower of the web is the fact that it's just a click, a tap, 
a selection. You can just kind of go from anywhere to anywhere instantly. It's interaction on demand. This seems kind of perfect for this problem. So why aren't we worried about that? Why aren't we thinking about that? Because whenever we talk about the web, all of us tend to really focus on the DOM, you know, that magic white rectangle. And it's gotten pretty awesome over the last couple of years. And it's doing some pretty amazing things. But we very rarely talk about this place. The URL bar, it's really boring. It's like, yeah, you want to go someplace? Type www.cnn.com. It's like, we've taken the most amazing rendering engine on the planet, and we've strapped a damn DOS prompt on top of it. It's like, what is up with that? I mean, come on, guys. We can do better than that. And so that's effectively what the physical web is trying to do. It's trying to say, let's take the URL, URL bar and bring it into the future. So let me just give you an example of how it works to see. So what I'm doing right now is holding a phone, pulling down the Today View on an iPhone. And as you can see, it basically shows there's a parking meter. And now I'm on the web. The physical web is done. I'm now on the web, and I'm on a web page just using basic web socket commands. And now I can say up, up, and I hit pay, and I'm done. And so whenever I show this to people in San Francisco, they almost go to tears. Because there, we have a pay it system in San Francisco, and nobody can ever bother to install the application. And so it's really about that. It's, not a, it's about making it lightweight. It's about taking the superpower of the web and making you use something within a tap or two. So that's what the physical web is trying to do. And we're basically making it so that you can walk up to any device. That device is going to be broadcasting wirelessly a URL over and over and over again. We're using Bluetooth low energy for now. There's other technologies we're thinking about. And it's literally just kind of going post-it.com or parkingmeter.com once a second, just boom, 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 boom. And then the phone just has a little scanner that when it wakes up, picks it up and takes you to that page. It's really kind of that simple. And it's actually hard to describe to people that it's just a web page because people think of web pages as like a news site or a portal. It's like, no, no, it's a parking meter web page. And it's a, it's a web page for one particular object, not a range of things. And it's kind of a twists people's way of thinking about what a web page can be. And it's really lightweight. You just walk up and use it. Of course, there's no apps. I'm not, I'm not an anti-app. I'm just saying as apps aren't convenient for this. Let's kind of use what the web is good for. But here's the critical thing. Whenever I explain this, people kind of go, but Scott, it's going to be constantly buzzing. And it's like, no. This is meant to be something that the user has to ask for. They have to like pull it down and say, show me what's around me. We're very, very much trying to buck the trend that iBeacon has had, which iBeacon tries to push things you know, and buzz in your pocket. We can't do that. This is trying to be the, the last kind of scanner you'll ever need. And if you can find everything, imagine walking into a mall with 50 things. Your phone would like vibrate out of your pocket, right? If it was, it was, so you, you, we're trying to respect the user and only show them things when they ask. So let me just, techn technically, people often think this is more complicated than it is. We just have a device up here that's just sending a URL. The URL is picked up by the phone, and the phone just simply, when the user picks it, just takes it to the cloud. It's, that's really it. It's not much more complicated than that. But I always get a bunch of questions afterwards, so I'll save you the trouble, and I'll answer questions one and two right now. Okay, questions one is, isn't this a QR code? Well, technically, yes, it's a QR code, but it's kind of a really awesome QR code. I like to think we fixed most of the problems with that, because with a QR code, I have to walk up to this thing and like take the picture right now. It's like, I have to, if, it's really clear to everyone around me which poster I'm going to, right? There's no, no discretion involved. I can have 50 things around me. I can see them all and kind of pick the one I want to. The other advantage is that I can see things from up to 50 meters away. So it's a lot more flexible. So the whole idea is that this is easy and light and simple for you to kind of see everything. The other question I get is, but what about spam? I'm like, you're right, absolutely, it's a, it's a big issue. But with at least with spam, uh, I'm sorry, what we're trying to do is we actually have something called the physical web service, a proxy. So what the client will do is it will gather all the URLs, send them up to the proxy service, and then can then get metadata, cache information, contact the websites on the user's behalf so there's no fingerprinting. We can protect the user. So it's, it's better for the user. It's better from a data point of view. And most importantly, it's open source so that you don't have to use our particular service. So it's about providing a mechanism to provide protection to the user. We feel very strongly about that. So we're based on top of Bluetooth low energy right now. Google about four months ago announced this Eddystone standard, an open source Bluetooth thing. So many people think that Bluetooth is iBeacon, and it, Bluetooth is the basic standard with an advertising packet and GAT services. And what you put in the advertising packet is what defines your service. So iBeacon has theirs, 
Eddystone has its own, and we are one flavor of it. We're the URL flavor. And the key reason that we used URLs is because there's no centralized server. You just go to your website. There's no company in the middle. You see a URL to yourco.com, and you go to yourco.com. There's no registration involved or anything like that. So what we're trying to create is two clouds, uh, basically a cloud of devices that are broadcasting URLs in a standard way, and then a cloud of devices that can then see it, whether it's a phone, a tablet, a TV, or goggles, or whatever, and those can even be proprietary. It's kind of equivalent to the way, the way browsers are. HTML on one side and browsers on the other. And so we're trying to make it so that anybody can write these things. That's why all of our code is open source. We're encouraging multiple companies to do this. But I want to reiterate really clearly here why we're, uh, how the physical web is involved, because literally the physical web is just the discovery of the URL to the phone. And once we're done, the, the web is done. I mean, so the physical web is done. The rest of it is all the web. So the parking meter example that you saw was just simply using WebSockets. And when people get upset about the fact, like, wait a second, Scott, you've got, you're really going to use WebSockets to a device in front of you? Isn't that complicated? You have heard of this thing called the Internet of Things, right? It's like, it's a, the whole idea is that this is getting really cheap. And these are four devices that are available today right now. The one in the lower left is basically from a company called Particle for 39 bucks. You have a little Arduino processor that can do all sorts of fun stuff with 10,000 messages you can send to a web service. This is getting really easy to do. So the whole idea of the physical web is that this device, this vending machine, can have its own connection to the internet. I can have my connection to the internet. And we just basically say, well, where do we rendezvous? How do we find each other? We don't have to be on the same subnet anymore to talk to each other. So the big thing for me, though, is as the web gets better, we get better. And so, for example, let me show you this. This is the same basic uh, discovery mechanism where we're pulling something down and finding it. And this time, though, we're using a service worker. So that this says, oh, there's you know, eight people in front of you. Do you want to get in line? And it installs the service worker. You put the phone away, and then five minutes later, when it's your turn, it just buzzes in your pocket. This time it buzzes because you opted in. But now, the physical web hasn't changed at all. It's just better because service worker now exists. And this is what's so cool about it. The web is getting really cool, and the physical web is just you know, making it easy to find this stuff. Here's a, something that's a Happy Meal toy that we made. It's a little 3D printed toy that we made. We've got a little processor in there. That's, all it is doing is we're using a new JavaScript library that we'll be talking about next week at Chrome Dev Summit, which is using JavaScript Bluetooth. So now you go to the web page, and the web page has a JavaScript library that connects right to the turtle. So now you don't have to go through the cloud at all if you don't want to. You can literally have a device that costs two bucks, and you're interacting with it and talking to it. This is orders of magnitude cheaper, and we think this is going to be really open up an awful lot more stuff. Step one is the physical web, and then step two is this JavaScript library. So we think that the web is really building to a crescendo here of enabling these things. People forget, though, that the, the delta between Netscape and Gmail was 10 years. And we're just getting started. The physical web is just a, a GitHub we announced a year ago. We're the third most popular GitHub. And so things have gotten really strongly quickly. We've gotten a lot of activity going on. Uh, we're very excited by the fact that actually in the last two weeks, both Opera and Firefox have um, announced that they are making their own scanners as well, which is like awesome news. And that really drives a key point here. First, you can do this today if you want to. You go to our GitHub, you can see all the stuff. We're on the Google Play Store and we're on the iOS Store. You can download our apps and play with it right now. We're also in Chrome for iOS. So if you just have Chrome on your, on your iPhone, you can do it right now. Uh, the other thing you, is that we are going to, we're working really hard to get into Chrome for Android, and everybody asks me every day, when are you going to ship? <sighs> we hope soon. We're trying really hard to do that. But the point is, it's not dependent upon us. Other companies are already doing it, and that's what's really cool. And the key thing I want to mention is that this is only going to be successful if we as a web community want this to be successful. This has to be the open web. It can't be a Google product. And that's why I'm on the Chrome team. I'm really proud to be on the Chrome team, because Chrome really sees this as an open web standard. So the key thing I want to mention is that, though, I get this all the time, we can't imprint upon what iBeacon did. Now, iBeacon is great. It's, I'm not trying to diss iBeacon at all. But everyone assumes that any time you use a beacon, you must copy what they did. And this idea that you are either going to be pushing coupons at people when they walk in the door, or you're going to track them as they go through the store. That's a fine use case if you're a retailer. And if you want to do that, please go ahead and use that more you know, active background scanning. But the whole point of the physical web is to be a lot more different. Because what we've discovered is that initially we're going to work with like a vending machine or a bus stop or a 
poster, and they got smaller and smaller. It was interesting about how we got smaller and smaller activities. But then we started realizing that it wasn't just corporate activities, it was personal ones. So imagine that you're presenting some slides at a, in a room full of people, and your computer is just broadcasting the URL to everybody in the room so they can follow along. Or a dog collar can have something, so if your dog gets lost, people can find it. Or even a for sale sign that has your phone number on it if you want, but it also can have pictures and history and so forth, and you just throw that in the back window of your car. So this is really unlocking a whole broad range of lightweight things that you would never have an app for. Because what we're discovering is that there's this this way the web has gone, because initially the web was very custom. You buy your website, you make your own HTML static pages, you would build it yourself, and eventually along came services that made it easier and easier to express yourself on the web. So then there was you know, Blogger, and eventually Twitter, and Facebook, and whatever, that took away all the plumbing from you. And we see that most likely this is the same thing will happen with the physical web. So for example, imagine that you get a Squarespace account. Well, then they, you just buy their deluxe edition, and they just send you something that you plug into your, in your retail store, and now your store is available to anybody who walks in. You didn't do anything. You just got the thing and plugged it in. You didn't even program the beacon. Or imagine that you actually go to Walgreens, and you buy that for sale sign in a pack of six for $15, and you pull the little plastic tab that goes live, you connect to it, you answer a couple questions, and now you've got something to throw in your car. So we expect that it'll start off by being a very corporate thing that you use to do vending machines or malls or stadiums, but it'll quickly, over time, evolve into something that's very consumer-driven. So the key part about the web is that it's got this long tail of content which is the, it's awesome that so many little things can add up to be such a big presence. The amount of e-commerce that happens on the web is way bigger than Amazon. And what we're finding is that as we talk about vending machines and bus stops and suitcases and toasters and all sorts of little things that just have a little bit more information, we're really talking about what we'll call the long tail of interaction. And we think this is what the web was born to do. Everything can have a little bit of information and let's make it really easy to get to it. So kind of in conclusion, what I want to let you guys know is that the key part about the physical web is reducing friction. The whole idea is the superpower of the web is anything can have a virtual more button. Let's figure out a way to do that. User first, no push notifications. We really want to respect the user. We don't want fingerprinting. We want to make sure that it's really done when they want it. It's a whole new way of thinking about it. Uh, the third thing is that it's open source. The beacons are open source. The scanning client is open source. The physical web service, our proxy service, is open source. You can do the whole thing and never use a Google system at all. And we think that's awesome, because we want this to be a rich environment where anybody can play around with it. Um, and as the web improves, so does the physical web. So as we're getting so many cool things, it makes things really, really fun. So, the, and the, the last thing, and the one that was the hardest for me to figure out, honestly, is I was so intrigued by having interactive vending machines that I forgot about interactive for sale signs. And it's really the tiny stuff, is the mundane stuff that I think is most powerful. So I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to talk to you guys afterwards. I really want to stress, though, this is only going to succeed if we as a community want it to succeed. So please, let's talk afterwards and ask me a lot of hard questions. Thanks very much.